we started to realize that the value that we were bringing wasn't just in making cool stuff. It was the insights and the strategy for how we had kind of reverse engineered virality. Hi there. Welcome to the Beam podcast from Super League. I am your host, Matt Edelman, president and chief commercial officer of the company. The Beam podcast focuses on how brands are entering the immersive web. What are they building and creating? How are they engaging the audiences who spend time in these platforms? What do they do to let their audiences and their target customer bases know that they exist and have something to offer in immersive platforms? And perhaps most importantly, how do brands measure the results based on the strategies they deploy? Today, I am excited to have two terrific individuals join me for the pod. Uh, we are here to welcome Eric Brownstein and AJ Hart from Shareability. Uh, Eric is the co-president and partner at the company, overseeing partnerships um, and new business development. Uh, AJ uh, runs Chaos Lab, and I'm going to get this right, uh, it's Shareability's innovation group which is focused on shared story experiences and the future of customer loyalty. But that only makes sense if you hear who Shareability is and what Shareability does as a company. And I'm going to ask Eric to give us a bit of an intro um, so that you have the context for why these gentlemen are going to be such terrific guests on, on today's show. Cool. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for having us on. Um, so yeah, shareability, we're a brand consultancy and a content studio. And um, we focus these days on uh, social strategies, specifically around social video. And uh, a lot of work with influencers, short form video content, TikTok and the like. Um, give you a little bit of background on the company and sort of why I think we're chatting today. Um, so Shareability is not an agency that tried to pivot to digital. Um, we were built from the ground up um, making viral videos for brands. And that's all we did. So YouTube was our playground. Um, big brands, big talent um, were our uh, sort of, you know, ingredients in the mix. And, um, and so we were really focused on how do you build engaging content um, that is native to the platform how do you organically integrate a brand into that or organically integrate talent into that? And, and as the company um, grew and we became known for that superpower, um, we started to realize that the value that we were bringing wasn't just in making cool stuff. It was the insights and the strategy for how we had kind of reverse engineered virality. And so we started to pivot the company to not only being a content studio and making, um, but to also guiding strategy. And so um, this has sort of culminated recently over the last year, we've become the lead partner uh, or the lead strategy partner for YouTube um, for sort of all things influencer strategy and execution, as well as guiding YouTube and Google on uh, social strategy. Um, we work with big brands like Mars and TurboTax, Intuit, and Adobe, um, and it's always been around, you know, how are you relevant on these social platforms with social video? Um, we've always tried to be kind of where the puck is going, and so AJ, as the head of Chaos Lab, you know, has really taken the lead on how we evolve our expertise in social video to better align with some of the big forces at play, right? Gamification, AR, VR, Web3, and so on. And so, you know, our premise is really, you know, if a brand and, and kind of by brand, I mean a company, an organization, an artist, a creator, wants to build deeper relationships with customers, uh, fans, whatever, they need to know that people want more and expect more um, from immersive experiences, you know, whether that's IRL or digital. And so we've ended up now doing strategic work in the space. And, and thank God that AJ is on this podcast with me. He's got his 
10,000 hours and and kind of can be, you know, our subject matter expert while I'm kind of talking about brands and and how I see them playing and and evolving, but but uh I'm excited for us both to dive in and to AJ to share his deep wisdom and knowledge. Well, we're we're all excited for for the the wisdom and knowledge. I just got to start with one observation, which is that shareability has probably the coolest office of any company that I've visited in LA. And it starts with your address. Your address is the shareability house. You know, I've been there. Yeah. It's a house. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to take credit for it, but I can't remember whose idea it was. It was either me or my partner, Tim's, but um, at the end of 2020, um, our lease was running out in Marina del Rey. We had a really pretty cool 10,000 square foot warehouse space. And as 2022 was progressing, it was pretty much Tim and I in this 10,000 square foot warehouse space. You guys had a lot of options of where to sit. You know, we, we kind of just walk around and, and it was a little <laughs> bit lonely. Um, so we had the idea of like, we should have a house um, you know, one that has sliding doors that allow for the airflow and, you know, it'll make people feel comfortable coming in and people from out of town could stay there and, and we could co-host cool events and, and so on. And, and so we looked at a bunch of houses and then we found this one on, on, in Mar Vista on the top of Mar Vista Hill. And I walked in and, you know, all the sliding doors were open, looking out at a 180 degree view of the city looking east, which I'd never seen the view before. They had you at hello. It was literally turned to the guy. I was like, where do we sign before I asked how much he was asking for it? That's great. Well, I'll tell you, for a place that's um, meant to inspire comfort, creativity, collaboration, and, and inspiration for, you know, coming up with strategies and solutions and content for, you know, some of the biggest brands in the world and artists and entertainers and creators. There are very few places I can imagine uh, being more conducive to that task and, and those set of objectives. So you started off really well by creating an environment that lends itself to creativity and 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 really again, I think comfort is a is a big component if you're you know uh, an agency and you're trying to work with you know brands who can really afford to work with anybody they they want um making them comfortable when they walk in the door and feeling special because of where they are um and then hopefully you know convincing them that they can trust you and enjoy spending time with you it's uh it's a big win so good call um yep. i think i might come stay there even though i'm in town once in a while, just because it's a cooler house than mine. Um, Dude, nicer than mine. So, <laughs> so our, you know, our podcast is really um, meant to help uh, marketing executives and um, and and people who are trying to help brands and IP owners uh, think about what it means to have a, a presence in the immersive web, and and you know, among other things, if you're going to have a presence, what should it be? Um, not only what should it be, but but how is it going to engage um, your target audience? How are you going to let people know that what you've built actually exists? And if possible, and almost as an imperative, how are you going to measure whether or not it was effective? Um, and without that measurement, it's really hard to justify making an ongoing commitment. Um, and, and sort of one of the premises that we have at Super League is this set of immersive 3D spaces really is starting to emerge as the next generation um, social engagement platform. And, and you guys from, you know, clearly the way you introduced the company have incredible expertise around the social platforms that have existed and, and really become so dominant over the last, you know, 10 plus years. Um, YouTube, people think of it as a video platform, but it really is. And it's a social platform where video is the central content. And so as you guys are thinking about the future of shareability and where um, consumers are going to be spending time and engaging with each other, how important are immersive platforms to the future relative to the importance 
of you know continuing to have um, a strategy on YouTube and TikTok? Are they all important? Is there a shifting balance? Where do you see things going? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, fr from a macro perspective, they're all steps in a journey, right? Every interaction a consumer has with the brand is, is part of that journey, and so the brand needs to offer and make that experience memorable rather than mundane. And, and so I think as brands start to lean into the immersive plays, that will move from a nice to have in the, sh in the short term to a must have, right? Because it will, it will appear less memorable when that experience is, is more passive, more laid back. Those stories and those moments that will linger will be the ones that are more interactive, more immersive, more communal that you and your friends are talking about three weeks later, rather than a, a short form video that you may have laughed at and forgot about 30 seconds later. Oh, that's interesting. So um, there was obviously a huge focus on the lean forward versus the lean back experience that was really a high level description of the difference between engaging with content on a digital device versus watching content on a television or a movie screen and and you're sort of saying now we're taking that one step further is that about right yeah exactly i i think you know for a long time we were were thinking of tv and radio as like our passive entertainment anchors always making that 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 comparison and i think ironically today's social media um, titans are, are are more passive when you juxtapose them against the immersive platforms so in, in some ways um the uh the, the passive entertainment bucket is is gaining in size. I think, you know, as as AJ said, this is a journey, right? And it's always evolving. And I think, you know, a lot of the the brands out there that we've encountered, they they sense this new world, which isn't even that new, right? Games games have been around them for a while. <clears throat> and the the experience and the interactivity of of games, right? But some of the common themes um are why we we find it really interesting, like you know, relevance and and resonance and engagement, um, you know, stories that really have stakes that people care about, and and so I think when we look at it, we think, okay, how do all these different elements give us a bigger playground, right? So social video is is one element. Um, but giving people the opportunity to to engage and and share experiences is where we start to get excited in in the world that you're living and breathing every day, right? Um, so how do those things all work together? How can how can a brand use an experience that its customers are having use that as as raw material for telling better stories for social video content, right? That's one way they connect. And, you know, even with some of the examples that we've been looking at recently and that I, I think you'll bring up at some point today, it's like, what are they doing with those on TikTok or on YouTube, right? Or are they just living in their immersive digital world, right? That is oftentimes disconnected from the other pieces. Yeah. Though, and, you know, that's a really important topic. So we'll dig into that a little bit. We are big proponents of helping brand understand that if they're going to have a presence in a platform like Roblox or Fortnite or Zepetto or build out a 3D um, uh, section of their website, that they are taking the opportunity by doing so to engage uh, audiences in a very specific way. But those same um, consumers, those same users are also interested in that brand and its presence on YouTube and on TikTok. And, and very few uh, marketing teams at this point seem to be thinking about how all of those pieces can connect other than maybe using, you know, a YouTube shout out to let people know that they have a new Roblox experience um, that's worth visiting. You guys are experts uh, far more than anyone at Super League in telling stories through sort of narratives um, that build a brand. You sort of come in at that high level and help a brand figure out how they're going to uh, bring their consumers along a journey. AJ, you mentioned, you know, that journey. So yeah. um, 
Talk a little bit about how you see these worlds intersecting and, you know, are there examples um, that, you know, you can point to or that you are excited about bringing to life as to where these different touch points build upon each other? Yeah, let me let me set you up, AJ, for that, because when we started kind of exploring, you know, this this space and by this space, I'll kind of talk about, you know, this kind of participatory space, this immersive space. And for us, that was, you know, as I mentioned, the elements of gamification or AR, VR, um, Web3 as well. Um, you know, we we saw the white space and where we could play, you know, in the storytelling lane, right? So when we started looking at things in the Web3 world, for example, we saw a lot of people talking about product roadmaps and utility and, and so on. And no one had a story roadmap, right? No one could really articulate where they were going to take people on a journey. And once again, why people were going to care, right? And so on. And so we said, hey, we're, we've got a lot of really killer storytellers. Um, I think that's, a, that's an area that we can really, really, you know, step into. And, you know, Yuga talked about the importance of story and Nike with Artifact is, you know, now in story mode and, and so on. And so that's where we saw the opportunity to bring all those elements together sort of under this umbrella that, you know, we have a several sort of names for, but um, I'll let AJ kind of dive in a little deeper on, on on our approach to it. Yeah, you know, from, from a macro approach perspective, the, the commonality or, or the way that I think about it is that most most of these modern experiences have, have four key touch points and that is immersive storytelling something that draws people in they're they're intrigued they're, they're gathered by this element of of, uh, of of brand lore then there's the gamification components which keep them leaned in participating the deeper immersion there's some component of a shared experience occurring that's communal so this is either digital or aggregating in the real world and then there's a reward mechanism at the end of that there's something that they take with them for their participation accomplishing two things it's bringing them deeper into the brand world and more making them more loyal to the brand but also more loyal to fellow lovers of that brand and that's where you start to see something very interesting happen and then as you alluded to it's important that any of these experiences don't exist in isolation and instead connect to the broader brand universe. And that's something that we loosely refer to internally at Shareability as the storyverse. And effectively, what that means is, is an interconnected narrative that every aspect of the brand ecosystem connects back to the same core story, core thematics, can of course evolve over time. Um, but everything needs to read true to that experience because you are engaging not just in these immersed worlds, but you are seeing them on YouTube. You're seeing the brand on TikTok. You might be seeing them in physical retail or showing up at a festival as a sponsor. Everything needs to relate back to that core story. And all of these little experiences, if they're designed properly um, and connected, it'll start to feel like a world that you're living in and participating in rather than you know something that the brand is advertising and beaming at you as a, as a more passive um, consumer. So I love the way you broke out those four components and yeah. and they match very well the way that um, our conversations develop with brands, even while we're focused primarily on what they create in an immersive platform. Um, but I, I think, you know, there are two things that occur to me. One is um, this set of themes have existed in the past and it's possible that if we were sitting here 20 years ago having a conversation about how a brand can engage its target audience, some of the same themes would have emerged in that conversation. And so is it really just at this point that technology is making the execution of these themes much more impactful? I mean, I know that from our perspective, when we talk about Web3, um, it's all inclusive of really three D, the 3D internet and the outgrowth of what is possible once you have a presence in an immersive 3D space. 
it doesn't necessarily uh, rely upon any specific te technology like uh, the blockchain. Um, however, we do see what some of these technologies enable, and that is instead of creating a one-to-one -one relationship between a brand and a customer, these technologies allow a brand to facilitate relationships between members of their customer base and essentially build community while they are also building affinity. Um, and, and again, so going back to the question, is it that technology now enables that to happen across more channels and more touch points, even if 15, 20 years ago, brands had the same goals? Absolutely. I, I think, I think tech, technology has, has dramatically expanded the possibilities. Just given the nature of, if we're talking, you know, Roblox or Fortnite branded experiences, the fact that a brand can launch a dedicated experience, people across the globe can gather with their friends and play and chat live in real time while they're having that experience. That was not something that, you know, we would have been doing, you know, two console generations ago or, or you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago. I was also going to say, you know, you've got the ownership aspect as well that that sort of Web3 unlocks, um, which, you know, provides a kind of different level of stakes, you know, at the end of the day. Um, right. And so I think that's that's something that, you know, obviously certain brands are really taking advantage of as well. You know, speaking of ownership, you can think of it as sort of a Web3 feature, but it's not. It's a feature in really any form of interactive environment. Inside Roblox, the average user owns 34 avatar, avatar items. 34. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have 34 things that I choose for out of my closet to wear in a given week. So the, you know, the, 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 the digital identity opportunities here and customization and imagining that if you convince somebody to buy a t-shirt in Roblox with your logo on it, you are not only getting perhaps a small amount of money, but that player, that user is then traversing a platform with 66 million daily active users with your logo, wearing it as a badge and absolutely being noticed because that's one of the things that players see and talk about when they run into each other. They'll make a remark about the hair you've chosen, the shoes you're wearing, the wings that are on your back, whatever it may be. And so, um, it, it speaks to the different small ways that a brand can do what you're talking about, which is tell this story um, and and create these you know these points of connection. I would argue that YouTube creators, an area you guys are incredibly familiar with, YouTube creators have become some of the masters of of engagement, and and I and I give them this may not be fair, and I might you know get some angry um, creators out there, but. Among video creators, I think being a YouTube influencer, a successful YouTube creator is harder than any other video platform because you really have to engage somebody for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes at a clip in order to um, be successful. And, and that's not necessary if you are producing a short video clip on TikTok or Instagram. And so the bar is just higher. And as a result, whether the talent is higher or not, the mastery of engagement through storytelling, I think, is a little bit um, more impressive. If you think about that creator class and the reality that the YouTube audience in many cases is younger, Gen Z and you know Gen A as an emerging viewer base, and you know as a YouTube creator that these, um, these viewers, these followers are spending an enormous amount of time inside immersive platforms, what's your opportunity or what should your um, goal be um, as a creator in in spending time in these immersive platforms or trying to be in front of your followers there or to give them a reason to care about you when they're in those spaces instead of watching your YouTube channel? Yeah, I think to build a bridge from the, the previous line of thought to this and then, and then to lead into to my response, I think you touched on a great point with somebody choosing to wear a, a piece of clothing in that ecosystem or or sports some sort of memorabilia that indicates resonance right so we've we have a shifting definition of resonance what does it mean for somebody to truly resonate with you as a creator you as a brand um that is deeper than it was before which may have been a like and subscribe you know now it's spending time in their virtual environment it's 
buying a piece of their memorabilia and choosing to wear it. Presence isn't enough, has never been enough. Resonance ensures deep success. So when we're looking at creators now in this ecosystem, with a shifting definition of resonance, it is no longer enough just to get that subscribe, just to get that like and engagement on the core content. If you really want to see and feel that deeper resonance with younger generations who live, that's their home turf, they live in these virtual environments, you need to figure out how to creatively expand what you do as a creator into a virtual environment, give the give your audience an opportunity to not just spend time in that in that surrounding, but to also own pieces of your brand world, whatever that looks like, it would be different for different creators. But that gives a higher indication of resonance, which will indicate longevity, which most creators aspire to uh, at the end of the day. So yeah. you have, I mean, a great you know, example is Creecraft and Carl Jacobs, right? Who built their own game inside Roblox. They are doing their best to have a hit experience uh, that that captures as many users on that platform as possible. But at the end of the day, if it's not the biggest hit and it's just another place for them to speak to an audience and try different forms of storytelling and content engagement, that seems to me like it's enough, right? They don't have to have the biggest game on Roblox in order for it to be useful to the growth of their of their brand. I 100% agree. And I think the bigger thing is just how does it make them feel? How do they feel after they leave the experience? Do they enjoy it? Was it fun? Are they talking about it to their friends a few weeks later? That matters more than getting hung up on metrics early on when you're experimenting. Yeah, I think the experimentation piece is the key. What you said, you know, trying things for, you know, different platforms, different audiences. That's that's always been our MO, right? Test and learn, test and learn. And I think that YouTube creators, they've got a you know, big opportunities and big challenges, right? So like our work with YouTube really started with their existential threat, which is short form video, right? YouTube was not short form video. And all of a sudden you've got TikTok and Reels and it's like, okay, how are we going to stay relevant to that younger demo? You know, and so YouTube shorts, you know, was their answer. And and how do you, how do you, how do you be a YouTube creator that's used to making long forward content? And now you've got YouTube shorts and other short form videos. So you got to deal with that on one side. And then you've got immersive experiences that are, you know, obviously exploding. And how can you take what you do and be authentic on, you know, on these other platforms and in these other spaces? It's it's very similar, right? As I said earlier, to what brands are faced with. You know, that's YouTube what I was going to ask you actually. Brand, you know? Uh, I'm so glad you went there because that was where I I sort of felt like, you know, we could maybe help some of our listeners um, take the leap now if they're working at a brand. So YouTube is a brand. They came to you um, or you went to them and uh, there was a, a good match in terms of need and capability and strategy and ideation and, you know, identifying objectives and um, where where it's ended up is you're helping them, you know, across strategic areas. And I'm sure that that has included helping them become more appealing to um, to creators as a place to create. And, and that's very similar to the challenges that a Roblox faces versus Fortnite Creative versus Zepetto and Rec Room and, and others. Um, but now you put yourself in a brand marketer's um, mindset. YouTube is a brand marketer in this example. You've worked, as you said, with other companies who've had to think the same way. Um, wh where will you? Where where can you sort of look at uh, a brand's objectives and help them understand? Okay, here is how I can you know really have an impact um, on a platform where they are already comfortable, like YouTube, but get them to sort of appreciate the importance of these multi touch point and deeper environments like the Robloxes and Fortnite creatives of the world. How do you help them sort of understand the importance? How do you get them over the hump where they may not have as much comfort and they may not have as much information? You know, how do you educate them and get them excited? What's the, what's the hook? 
I think, uh, AJ, can I steal your quote? Um, Any, anything I've ever said, what, yeah, welcome to it. That's it, great. It, I'm going to use the quote on the next episode and take credit for it. So it. just be prepared. Yeah, great. just attribute it to me and then they'll have to figure out that it was AJ before that. Um, Perfect. You know, AJ said, you know, brands absent here are like brands absent from reality. Um, this is where people are, right? And this was the same thing going back to, you know, 2007 when I was guiding brands about why Twitter was important, right? This is where people are. This is where the conversations are happening. This is where people are having experiences, right? So you need to be in those places, but you can't be the guy showing up at a dinner party, handing out business cards, right? You need to be the one that comes in <laughs> listening and understanding and, you know, not being intrusive, right? Bringing value. And you can't do any of that until you understand what's going on. Especially so, if you want to be invited back to the dinner party. A hundred percent, right? It's like, I've been at the same poker game for 20 years and there's people that show up one time and they don't show up again, um, you know, because they came in, you know, like a wrecking ball. They came in like a bull in a china shop. And, and or did so they just, did they just win all the money? Well, that too, you know, they were too good. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it really has that same quality that, you know, when we were talking to brands about social media, like, how do you show up? You know, how do you have a presence? How do you participate? Um, how do you bring value, right? These are all the fundamental questions that I think that the brands need to be asking um, and really understanding the community. And that's not an easy thing. And it takes it takes a bit of humility. Yeah. And I think when you're designing and thinking through the lens for, for a brand, for a creator who's established on certain platforms with a certain community that's active, there's certain story beats they respond to, Kind of dial that in when you think about expanding and having other touch points what i've started to i've started to relate it is a community network model basically you can have all these isolated groups that are a little different with some overlap that respond and are active in different ways you could have as a brand a very active fortnite community that's different than your roblox community and what they like and what they respond to it's different than your TikTok community there might be some overlap and over time you're building these different groups that all the commonality that they all are bound to is that core, which is the brand and that core thematic that is translated in different ways. And you're building a brand with true network effects where everyone's buzzing across every corner of our digital ecosystem about some component of the brand. And sure, some of them relate and some of them might not, but the core thing they all do have in common is a love of your brand. And the important thing is just noting that one, that's okay. You can have subgroups that are smaller in size with very specific content and approach dialed into them. Um, but then two, being able to be bold and experiment and be willing to fail at first and not and be humble enough to the point Eric said to come in and just listen and learn and not try to take what you did on a different for a different little subset of your network and just copy paste. I think people have the perception that only super young, cool brands, you know, should be trying to participate in 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 digital immersive and in other types of kind of participatory experiences and you know this is not a digitally immersive example but like state farm comes to mind when they did a really successful big kind of web3 ar activation where they had a big scavenger hunt around the country with people finding footballs and you know, reminded me of Pokemon Go, right? You'd, you'd see on your little map, there's a football there and you'd run and get it and you could win all kinds of prizes. And, you know, they didn't call it an NFT that went in your wallet, but it was. And now they've got like well over a million people, you know, who have this direct connect and direct sort of, um, you know, uh, path to communicating with them. Um, we did the same thing, building out a strategy for a big financial company that wanted to be in sort of the web three space. And, you know, our kind of starting point was respect the community, right? Invite big artists to be part of a gallery, um, you know, go to the OG, you know, um, artists in the space, show them that you kind of know what's up before you come in and do something stupid. But yeah, there's room for all these players. We had an experience like that recently by bringing Hamilton to Roblox, 
And who would have thought that a Broadway production belonged on a gaming platform, yet the fit was perfect. We got more than a million visits within the first two weeks. Um, we are in the top 10% of all Roblox experiences in terms of engagement. Uh, our rating is still at, I think, 97%. And it was, you know, connected to the value of storytelling. We actually took a narrative from a Broadway production and we turned it into a fun game that has some historical references, but also is true to the production itself and brought the characters and some of the music, you know, into the experience. Um, and it is exactly as you're referencing a brand that you would not necessarily anticipate being in an environment where all the cool kids hang out, except it worked. And I would argue Hamilton happens to be one of the cool kids because it's such a timeless story that is relatable to all ages, but it's not obvious on the surface. And there are other examples. I mean, Walmart has made a very big push into immersive platforms, Roblox being a prime example. Walmart is certainly a place that everybody knows, but I don't know a lot of people who call it cool. Um, and so that might just be me and my, you know, my circle and that could be shameful, but it's it's my experience. Um, one of the cool brands that I remember from you know when I was when I was young um, were Bomb Pops, and we just happened to be sitting here in a week where Chupa Chups and Bomb Pops, you know, both uh, in the F and B category, have launched um, Roblox experiences. You guys have um, a track record, as you said, working with another. I'll, I'll call them an F and B brand in Mars. Um, uh, Bomb Pops had some, you know, great, you know, uh, achievements that were recently publicized where they had 20 million items um, sold in the campaign's first week and 75 Bomb Pop themes, custom items were included. Um, and uh, and when you think about their social following, right, you've got, um, checking these numbers, um, about 76 average likes on their Instagram posts and about 1,500 to 2,000 average views uh, of their TikTok posts. And here I am talking about 20 million items sold that are bomb pop branded in the first two weeks. That's just the F&B category, but broadly, you know, when you look at verticals that you guys operate within, you mentioned finance, I mentioned F&B, You've got sort of the creator vertical that YouTube sort of represents. Do you see this type of strategy really being applicable to all verticals who care about users under the age of 25? Um, or really, are there some brands for whom this wouldn't make sense? I think it really, I think it really does make sense for most. It's just about being very intentional with how you translate. Um, and, and I think one of the key things is gamification can't just be adding more steps to the user journey. Some brands just think that by going and playing in gamification, adding adding some things, whether it's a full blown immersive experience or just a, a gamified campaign, that that is in and of itself enough. It's understanding why people spend time in these environments and building the right experience, adding the right emotion and motivation behind what you're doing. I mean, when I look at the shifting definition of resonance to the bomb pops example, right? It's the best selling food item ever on Roblox, but you're telling the social metrics there that sound like they're not a resonant brand, but clearly they they are. If you're if you're like, are they resonant? Yes, the resonance definition has shifted. And so when we think about can any brand play in the space, I think it's a good that's a good example of a brand who on social in the last couple of years may not have looked resonant, but did an experiment figured out the right way to translate over, did it in a way that obviously worked well with the core. And and now our new definition of resonance shows and indicates that um, the young generation does care about the brand. And there's now a million places that they can they can go to continue showing up and being a part of where the culture is. And and what what I think is actually really interesting in this is that there's this idea of platform specific resonance, right? Mm. So Bomb Pop came in and they crushed it. They killed it. So I looked at their YouTube channel and I was like, okay, cool. What did they do with this success? And they ran a 15 second video that has 1.8 million views and 32 likes, right? So they basically were like, cool, we should spend some money on YouTube because we just crushed it over here on Roblox. 
and let's run an ad. Right. Right. Like what? Wait, what, what? Like to me- A little bit of a miss. A little a bit of a huge, miss. Huge miss, right? And, and so the resonance per platform is is really key. I'd, I'd love to try to think of a brand that's trying to appeal to a younger demo that couldn't find platform-specific resonance for an immersive kind of a, you know environment like a Roblox. Like that'd be well, a fun challenge. Yeah. What you just said, Eric, is like a really good illumination as well of what we called the story verse earlier, but that interconnected set, right? They had this big experience in Roblox, the narrative thread, they, collaborating with the creator, doing doing something that ties into, they have the most sold food brand item ever in Roblox. There's creative ideas and territories that come out of content, fake news broadcasts, whatever. Just figure out a way, workshop it, and create a story that threads over to the other social platforms that amplifies and feels connected and and but in a way that translates for their audience there. And if they don't have one, again, start from scratch, but make sure the story beat feels right because they're building a connected ecosystem. When you when you think about the content creators on these platforms, there's a relatively common um, sort of thread, which is that a small segment of the users of these platforms then become the creators of the content that drives them. I don't know if the YouTube statistic from many years ago is still correct, but at one point, 1% 1 of the people who visited YouTube were the ones creating the you know hundreds of millions of, of pieces of content over time. Um, Roblox is certainly in the same zone with 66 million daily active players. They're really going to somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10,000 experiences that um, are, you know, are on the platform in a given day. If you're a brand and you're trying to insert yourself into what essentially is the creator class on these platforms, um, how are you able to kind of get in the mix? And, you know, is it is it really reiterating some of the things that we've talked about? It's got to be resonant. It's got to be relevant. It's got to be authentic. Um, is it appropriate to try to work with the existing creators? You know, a lot of the work we do with brands and that Bomb Pop just did, we just launched a Maybelline experience in a Roblox game named Splash, where, where we have helped brands work with the creators on the platform and that's how they get started. H how do you think about, you know, a brand's opportunity to interact with the creator class in these immersive spaces? So I would get to still it down to three, three things, like connect or consider, connect, co-create. So cons consider what your what, what your intent is on the platform. Understand the, the creators, understand the beats, and come in at least with a strategy of some sort. Connect with those content creators and then co-create with them as a brand before trying to go off on your own and, and, and play in an area that you're not familiar with. Because you do have a new creator class that might operate and function in ways that are a little different, but they're going to be the experts that can provide a crash course in education. So as long as you're intentional about entering into that relationship, understand the culture, will defer to the expertise of the creator that you're working with. There'll, there'll be appreciate, appreciation and mutual respect there. And then you're able to co-create and do so in an, an authentic way. And I think we've seen a lot of brands miss that step or get bad advice to not take those steps. But again, that, that would be best summed up in my mind as consider connect, co-create. And, and AJ, the, you've got a lot of potential blog posts in your future. Just, you know, the, the, the quotes, the, the four components, the, the three C's, I can see you. Like, the way the you brain know. works. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You know, when, when AJ, you know, the consider piece, right? It's for us, the process that we've, we go through is a pretty kind of um, well-defined, kind of well-oiled, well-tested process. And um, one of the key elements of that, right, is is getting to that place of, okay, well, which creators should we be working with, right? That's a huge uh, imperative to get right if you're a brand, right? A, on the cost, B, on the results. And so, you know, diving deep into you know, the, the audience of a creator, their community, right? Needing to go several layers down into niche and sub niche communities is something that we've found is really important to success. And so 
promoting, let's say, a big campaign with Black Pink, you know, big K-pop band, biggest girl band in the world, the 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 first, you know, kind of default would be, hey, let's find Black Pink fans who are creators. Okay, that's good. Or maybe K-pop fans who are creators. But when we start looking deeper at the campaign, right, it was going to be a dance challenge. And we said, oh, maybe what we really need are in, you know, creators that have a, an expertise or are known for dance challenges. And do they uh -huh. have an affinity or an overlap with K-pop or Blackpink? They may not be the biggest Blackpink or the biggest K-pop fans, but man, dance challenges is where they're at. And by the way, those creators will likely perform better than just the Blackpink fan or the K-pop fan. And so as a brand is considering who to work with, right? They really need to get tight on that overlap between their audience, their community, and the campaign itself that they're running and what's going to drive the best results. So we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask you if you're able to share something that shareability is is working on uh, that is, you know, one of the most sort of exciting and you know, up and coming um, programs or or brands or launches that you can't wait to share with that brand's target audience or a target audience you're developing and where immersive might fit in? You know, it's a, it's a really good question. And the one that comes to mind is actually Mars. Um, okay. And, you know, we, we, we ran Mars's first TikTok campaign probably three years ago or something and or two years ago they you know they're a big company and they are relatively conservative when it comes to taking risks and so going on TikTok and running a campaign that they would put paid media behind was something that they really wanted to be cautious about so the creators that we chose and you know all of the sort of guardrails we put in place um, has you know allowed us over the years to build a, a trust and relationship, and so Orbit is you know one of the biggest gum brands in the world, and you know the task that we have with them is to help make Orbit relevant to a younger demo, um, using TikTok primarily as the platform, and so what we've developed with them, which is what I think is really exciting and scalable across Mars brands and beyond is a collaborative process with their internal social team, right? So this is not normal for a creative agency or a digital agency to do with a brand where, you know, we are literally doing everything together. So it is a, you know, we're, we're working on the briefs that came out of the strategic work together. We're doing um, ideation together. Um, the the hive, which is their internal social team, is creating some of the content. We're going to creators to do other content, and the trust that we're building there just with that one brand, I think, is going to allow us to explore multi-platform extensions. Right, so going beyond TikTok, going into Fortnite, going into Roblox, going into these gamified experiences. Um, is exciting, you know, for a global brand with some of the most iconic, you know, um, candy brands from Skittles and M and M's to Snickers, you name it. Um, so I'm, well, I'm now there's the developing. now there's the bomb pop bar, right? So it's it's exactly. an opportunity to raise that bar, and of course, it needs to be a partnership between Shareability and Super League and Mars, and will exceed will exceed that bar. Hundred percent. I, I I love that you guys joined joined me today. Thank you very much. I really want to um uh you know um make sure that uh you know how grateful we are when people come talk about you know their uh ideas and and their strategies and how they see the brand marketing world developing across emerging platforms. And so um, one more big thank you to Eric Brownstein. Uh, the president and AJ Hart, the head of the innovation group, uh, Chaos Lab at Shareability. Um, it's great to talk to you guys, and I look forward to another conversation in the future. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fun to have a platform to talk about this stuff. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Beam. Please make sure to like and subscribe, and stay tuned for future episodes coming soon.